Okay, well, I'm going to get started. It looks like we have our fashionably late Stanford crowd here as winter quarter rolls on, and I'm expecting uh, people will keep trickling over the next couple minutes. Uh, welcome back. This is our penultimate, um, as I'll comment in a minute, uh, seminar in our wildfire seminar series for winter quarter. Again, I'm your host, and I'd like to acknowledge the Bill Lane Center, Woods Institute, and Stanford Sustainability Data Science for graciously supporting this endeavor. I hope you've enjoyed the talks thus far. Uh, a special note, if I can get my screen to work here. If you were here last week, uh, we had a lot of technical difficulties and we lost our speaker. Uh, he sends his apologies. He was on travel and lost internet access. He is offering us a reboot of his seminar uh, next week. So if you're interested and can join us, we will be meeting here um, next week, same time, to hear Bill Mester uh, continue. I mean, he started about 10 minutes in. He will restart and represent his work on some of the utilities efforts to mitigate wildfire risk and partnerships needed to ensure success. So please come back next week to hear that. Um, I can't be more pleased. I think we got one of the superstars that can lend us a, a, a really important perspective in this really important topic of wildfires today, uh, Dr. Amy Cardinal Christensen is Métis and grew up in Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta, Canada. Her Métis relations are of Cardinal, Piasis Band, and Labucan settlement families. She currently lives near Rocky Mountain House in Treaty 6 in Central Alberta. A Amy is a seasoned uh, research scientist in the Canadian Forest Service of National Resources Canada and is currently on interchange to Parks Canada as an Indigenous Fire Specialist in the National Fire Management Division. Amy works with the Indigenous nations across Canada on fire stewardship practices like cultural burning and collaborates with Indigenous peoples from around the world on decolonizing land management. She also studies wildfire evacuations and advocates for Indigenous wildland firefighters. She is co-author of several books, including First Nations Wildfire Evacuations, a guide for communities and external agencies, and Blazing the Trail, Celebrating Indigenous Fire Stewardship. Amy also co-hosts the Good Fire podcast, which I have listened to, which is really awesome, so I encourage you to check that out, which looks at Indigenous fire use around the world. Um, I'm excited to hear her speak today because I think she will lend a very much needed perspective on how we can think about fire um, and maybe talk a little bit about good fire and try and make sure we draw the distinction between fire and good fire. Um, and we're happy to have her here today. Amy, I'm going to hand over the controls to you. Would you prefer for questions to be withheld to the end of your presentation? Or do you mind being interrupted midstream? And if it's the latter, I'm happy to facilitate because I don't expect you to monitor chat, et cetera. Uh, while you are speaking. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Amy, yeah, Amy said she can't hear me. Um, did you hear anybody? Apparently not. So it's on her end. No, I, apparently she can't. Can we hear her? Have her speak. Let's see if we can hear her at least. Hello? There you go. And you should turn our speakers up. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, we can hear her. It just uh, maybe she should just start a presentation at least. Can you hear me okay? Can you give me the thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, very strange. I don't know what 
happening there. I um, yeah, have my speakers on. I tried my AirPods, but it seems like there's no incoming audio. But I'll just um, yeah, start speaking, and then hopefully I can figure it out. Yeah, and I heard you as well, so I don't know what happened there. Um, very strange. But anyways, I'll just start talking. So you could just use the chat if you um, I guess need to interrupt <laughs> me if something's not happening. That'd be great. Well, I'll just share my screen here. Um, okay, um, so I'm just assuming, I guess, that you can see this because I can't see you to give me the thumbs up or anything um, if it's not working. Um, so yeah, my name's, uh, maybe actually I should just stop sharing and make sure that you can hear me first before I launch into this. No, no, we could hear you. We could see the screen. <laughs> Sorry, one second here. Yeah, we can okay, see maybe and hear can you. Just give me a thumbs up if you can see yourselves on my screen. Okay, perfect. Could you see it before, Derek? Okay. Yes. Okay, awesome. I'll just proceed then. So yeah, my name's Amy Cardinal Christensen, and I'm just here to talk about Indigenous fire stewardship in Canada. So thanks very much for the invite to this session. So I'm currently an Indigenous fire specialist with the National Fire Management Division of Parks Canada. So with our group, basically we provide oversight and support for all the different national parks in Canada on fire. And I'm currently on interchange here from my position as a research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. So in Canada, we have three Indigenous groups, um, and we're, they're the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit. So when we use the term Indigenous peoples, we're referring to all um, three groups. And so we have many different First Nations in Canada. There's over 800 different groups. So if you hear me mention First Nations or Métis, I'm explicitly only speaking about those groups. But when we, yeah, when we say Indigenous people, we're just referring to all three. So um, as I mentioned before, um, I'm a Métis woman. Uh, I, my family is from Treaty 8 territory, so that's Northern Alberta. And I have two sides of my family, so the Lavican family and the Cardinal family. So this is a picture of my um, aunts and uncles in front of, and my grandmother in front of the, the Lavican settlement sign, which was uh, for the Métis people of Canada, when settlers first started coming through, they pushed them off of their buffalo hunting grounds in Manitoba and basically pushed them um, west, where they ended up settling in an area in Alberta they called the Lavican Settlement. And the cardinal side of my family is actually from a band called Piesis Band, which was original signatories on Treaty 6. And so I currently live in Treaty 6 territory in a town called Rocky Mountain House. And so just wanted to acknowledge the land that I'm on and the land as well that you are on as well. So um, Canada has uh, experiences wildfire evacuations every year. And so this map shows the extent of evacuations from the east to the west coast and up north across Canada. So the black um, circles are uh, evacuations of non-Indigenous communities in Canada, and the larger the size of the circle, the bigger the wildfire um, evacuee number. Uh, and so our biggest evacuation in Canada was the city of Fort McMurray, which was the evacuation of 100,000 people in northern Alberta, um, and that occurred right in this area. And the orange dots are Indigenous communities that have been evacuated throughout Canada. So you can really see um, through this, we have the, what we call the boreal forest in Canada, which is this um, area. And really most of the communities that are evacuated from wildland fire there are indigenous uh, communities. So only about 5% of the population of Canada identifies as indigenous, but about 42% of the evacuations that we have in Canada from fire are of indigenous communities. So it really shows the disproportionate impact that um, wildfire has on us in Canada. And this map here shows repeat evacuations of different communities in Canada. So the black, the number in the black circle is the number of times a community has been evacuated in the last 40 years in Canada. 
So um, all of these communities are different Indigenous uh, nations, except for this one here, which is West Kelowna, British Columbia, which is a non-Indigenous community. But uh, you can see we've had four different uh, First Nations that have been evacuated seven times um, just in the last 40 years from wildfire events. We've had a few that had about six evacuations, a bunch around five. And so it's really just showing this repeated um, impact on communities and that really has nothing much has been done to change the, you know, the exposure of these communities or their vulnerability to wildfire that's caused by colonization. So um, this is a graph that just shows uh, the types of communities that are impacted by wildfire in Canada. So across the bottom um, bar, you can see that it's the number of evacuation events that communities have had. And then the bigger the bar um, is the bigger, like the number of evacuees. So depending on how thick the bar is. So again, just to highlight here, this big black bar here of primarily indigenous population that shows just the number of um, reserves in Canada that have been evacuated from wildfire and the number of evacuees compared to non-indigenous communities um, across our country. And another interesting thing to look at is the cause of evacuation. So in Canada, about 78% of evacuations are from the direct threat of wildfire. So that's where, you know, a wildfire is entering a community or there's ember shower occurring in the community um, where, you know, it's that the community needs to leave because there's potential for it to be burned, which is really important to point out is that for First Nation or for, in, sorry, for communities with greater than 50% Indigenous population, the direct threat of fire is only 60%, um, whereas smoke is actually a really large proportion of why um, Indigenous communities in Canada get evacuated. And much of this is because our communities are remote, um, so it's very, like they're fly-in only, fly-out only during certain times of the year, and so aircraft is needed to evacuate these communities. So when smoke starts coming in, starts impacting people's health, usually they're pretty quick to evacuate the communities because even more smoke can mean that it's impossible to evacuate communities as the fire rolls in. So we really see increasing risk across Canada to fire events. Um, and so the GIF on the one side just shows one of the fires that we had in British Columbia, the Ashcroft fire. And it just shows the extent and how quickly it moved um, across the landscape. Uh, endangering many Indigenous communities. Um, and so 60% of First Nation reserves in Canada um, are located within or intersect that, what we now call the wildland human interface or what you in America call the wildland urban interface. And um, there's a much more uh, frequent fire return intervals for our reserve populations in Canada compared to non-reserve. So that means that um, people who live on reserve are more likely to experience more frequent fires. And under climate change projections, those numbers are expected to increase substantially um, for reserves compared to non-Indigenous uh, communities. So we've done some work through the First Nations Wildfire Evacuation Partnership, looking at the evacuation experiences of First Nations people who've uh, experience wildfire. And this book is kind of one of the products out of that research. And so what we're really, um, we're doing with speaking with First Nations people across Canada who were evacuated from wildfire and talking about their vulnerability um, that was caused by colonization. So lots of times we hear that um, Indigenous people in Canada are the most vulnerable group because of all sorts of different um, issues that they face in terms of overcrowding, water issues, and other things directly caused by colonization. And so how that impacts as well, like their ability to prepare for and respond to wildfires. In Canada, jurisdiction is a huge issue. So emergency services and fire management in Canada are under provincial jurisdiction, whereas First Nations communities are under federal jurisdiction. So when evacuations happen, there's oftentimes a lot of confusion on who has responsibility for what and unfortunately, it just seems to repeat every single year we go through the same thing. There's low levels of preparedness in communities um, due to chronic underfunding. There's a huge lack of trust in agencies. There's been a lot of remote evacuations of communities and the separation of families. And so when we're talking about the separation of families, lots of this, again, is evacuation by aircraft. So we're not talking about people just being put up in like a different hotel in a town. 
It's literally families that are separated by hundreds of kilometers um, during evacuation events where they're basically just flying people out and trying to land them somewhere where they can stay. Again, there's the new issues on top of old issues. So, you know, you're having all of a sudden fire events um, that are happening and impacting people, but those are occurring on top of other things that I mentioned before, like chronic over crowding and housing, um, poverty in communities, there's drug and alcohol addiction too. And lots of times too with these evacuations, we think that it ends when communities are repatriated. So when people return home, then that's the end. But what we heard from lots of people that even two years, three years, five years after evacuation, there were still a lot of negative impacts they were experiencing. Um, there was a lot of financial loss at that time. And one of the biggest things is that the communities generally lose power. So they don't have fridges or freezers. So as well, I won't get much into this given this group, but we're seeing increasing risk um, for wildfire in Canada. And that's from climate change, from the fire exclusion policies that we've had across Canada, from the current fire suppression practices that we see, from different forest management practices we have, like the leaving of slash after clear cutting, and the expansion of the wildland urban interface population. So just to step back a little bit in time um, and look at you know, how things used to be in the land that we now call Canada. So indigenous people across Canada have used fire on the landscape and we say since time immemorial and I know that's becoming like a term that some people don't like but it basically just means since as long as we can remember, like as long as our stories go back, um, we can't really remember a time for many nations without fire um, being used. And so the fire knowledge is not singular. There's no pan-Indigenous approach to cultural fire, but rather it's plural and it's deeply connected to place and that there's significant knowledge that was held and is still held by nations. And Importantly, fire is not just fire for our communities. Um, for many nations, there's a very important ceremonial tie in different uh, responsibilities that we feel that we have to the land. Um, and fire is just an extension of that. So in Canada, indigenous peoples like in California sought to replace fires of chance with fires of choice. So taking away those unexpected lightning fires, although we still had those, and um, you know, that's one thing that I've heard um, my other colleagues talk about is the importance of lightning um, on our landscape. And so, but what happened was when we would clean the land or use fire to achieve different cultural objectives, it would also reduce the risk of those lightning fires causing more extensive damage. And so people would say, I didn't, um, an elder said, I didn't set the forest on fire just for the sake of burning, but so that I could return to hunt the next year and live. And so on the left is a, a group um, of indigenous folks demonstrating a prairie fire start in 1903. And we're pretty sure that this was from a uh, Blackfoot, but it wasn't um, marked in the uh, historical archives there. And then on the right is actually just a recent picture of some uh, students from Cumberland Health Métis uh, who were burning up there for muskrat. And you can see the snow on the ground and that was the technique that they used. They burn in the winter to improve muskrat habitat. So indigenous knowledge systems, including fire, have been shown in multiple studies to steward biodiversity, to provide nature-based solutions to climate change. And also I should have included on here that they're a type of indigenous disaster risk reduction, which is another really popular um, phrase that we're hearing now. And it's currently through the UN, they're really promoting this idea of indigenous disaster risk reduction, where you know we have the knowledge to reduce risk to our communities. So in Canada, similar to California, we went through this period of cultural severance, basically, where um, we were told that we couldn't use fire on the land, that our knowledge wasn't proper, um, didn't fit in with like the European styles of land management that were brought over. And so um, uh, Kirsten Vignetta wrote a, has written a really good paper, I have the link there, um, on the US Forest Service and their relationship to fire and Indigenous peoples. But, it's very similar in Canada, where the wildfire management um, agencies racialized light burning and delegitimized or erased Indigenous people in our knowledge. And so that was through three key narratives. 
one was discrediting us. So, you, you know, talking about our knowledge is savage or, you know, not as good as Western science. There's also the idea of downplaying, like saying, you know, that we couldn't possibly manage landscapes um, using fire and indigenous knowledge. Um, and also that in, there weren't that many indigenous people. Um, and then the idea of erasure so that, you know, we didn't actually exist on our landscape, that idea of terry, terra nullius, that the land was empty when European settlers arrived. And so we recently put out a paper called Centering Indigenous Voices, the Role of Fire in the Boreal Forest of North America. And what this um, article does is it centers Indigenous uh, people who um, had contributed to past publications and tries to take some power back. And so instead of, you know, the Academy is always trying to, you know, guess or hypothesize how we used fire, but it's actually going and talking to Indigenous people about using fire and what happened. And so Table one is one of the things that I'm most proud of, and it's a list of over three dozen species that are known to have been managed um, with indigenous burning practices in the boreal forest. So one example there is like the low bush uh, blueberry, um, different nations. And so these are ones that have been recorded in the literature already. Um, and so uh, the reasons for burning include the creation, the maintenance and renewal of berry patches um, and increasing berry sweetness. So again, similar to California, what we're trying to do is take that landscape um, that's on the top left there, where you know we could see through the canopy, we could see patches, we could see mosaics on the land, like much more biodiversity. Um, and in the second picture, that just shows like when fire suppression started happening and the forest started converting to these like massive blankets of coniferous trees that are really prone to disturbances like fire insects. And then on the bottom is the consequence that we see, which is these out of control wildfires that just run across our landscape here. And on the right is um, an example of an indigenous community burning um, in uh, beaver habitat, like in the wetlands, uh, and shows that relationship that we have with our relative beaver. And again, we see this in real life in Canada. Um, on the top, you can see a 1930s picture where we can see that patchiness in the forest. Uh, seeing down to the the, um, the floor through the canopy, seeing lots of meadows and prairies. And then the middle picture just shows that overgrown where we're really starting to see coniferous trees take over. And then the bottom picture is a picture after a fire went through and devastated um, many communities in that area and caused a lot of smoke um, impacts for communities too. And so really it's trying to return to that initial state. So I think in Canada, what we want to see is a reunion with fire where indigenous people are put into leadership positions around fire. Um, and uh, the bottom left picture is um, from a Métis cultural fire camp that we had at the Rocky Mountain Historic Site where you know it's teaching youth to get out on the land and burn. And the drip torch there is interesting because many people don't consider it a cultural burn if you use a drip torch, but because of agency, um, and other things and the you know guidelines that we have to follow for some communities that's how they have to burn at the moment and on the right is um some art by karen erickson that's showing that uh, reunion with fire uh, she's a metis artist from northern british columbia and just showing the importance not only of fire on the landscape but also in our ceremony and in our home So since I started, I've heard a lot about, you know, well, what's the difference between cultural burning and prescribed fire? Like don't agencies just do enough burning? Um, but really in at Parks Canada, where I am now, we really differentiate between the two practices and we actually have them totally separate. So cultural fire is indigenous led around cultural objectives. It's indigenous knowledge driven around the time to burn and techniques for burning. It's generally these slow, cool burns. Uh, I've heard elders describe it as fires that we can walk beside and they're family centered. Uh, so you have like um, your uh, kids on it, elders, um, it's more of a community gathering. And then again, there's that question mark around accelerants. So many elders and fire keepers that I work with prefer the use of traditional fire ignition methods. Um, and so prescribed fires are agency driven. Um, usually at Parks Canada, they're around hazard reduction, 
or, or ecological objectives, and usually it's one, so something like improving grizzly bear habitat. Um, there's production burning, so as much burning in as little time as possible. As you can see, there's usually these big events, you know, where they get a bunch of people out, a bunch of firefighters, helicopters, other things on the land, um, and light it up. <laughs> so it varies in intensity. Um, and usually with Parks Canada, many of our fires are crown fire replication fires or stand replacing fires. And they use an incident command system, so a paramilitary structure. And of course, they love the accelerants. So the fuel-based drip torches, heli torches, ping pong balls, all that stuff. So to try and uh, support Indigenous fire practices, uh, the Parks Canada, the National Fire Management Division, where I work, is forming an Indigenous fire circle. And the idea of this is that this group will provide us with strategic advice on the quality and overall development of Parks Canada's fire management policies and programs. Um, around four main points. So Indigenous engagement, Indigenous-led cultural burning on parks land, a potential Indigenous fire guardian project, which is a big thing that's getting a lot more attention up here, and I'll speak about that a bit more, and uh, Parks Canada's approaches to fire management, um, including cultural safety of Indigenous firefighters. Um, and so this is an example of a burn that happened in Waterton Lakes National Park in Canada, and so you can see the fire slowly moving across the landscape there. And uh, what it is being exposed is a Blackfoot Confederacy marker. So this is an important site for the Black, uh, Blackfoot people. Um, it's the beaver bundle um, where it was shared um, amongst nations. And so it's been uh, marked there. And anyway, this shows that, that fire you know, can um, also be good in how it cleans and, and restores cultural values. We have a book in Canada that we put out. It was written by 10 different Indigenous authors who are involved in fire, and it's called Fire Smart. It's a Fire Smart Canada product, I should say. It's called Blazing the Trail, Celebrating Indigenous Fire Stewardship. And in it, it talks about the difference between, you know, good fire, bad fire, Indigenous burning practices, and really looks at what communities can do to reduce their risk of fire. And there's 12 different case studies in there of different Indigenous nations and what they're doing for fire. It's not all cultural burning. Um, there's different things that different communities are doing. Um, and so I really like the book because it's really, really diverse and focuses on you know, the multitude of things that, that you can do to reduce fire risk. It's not just one step. So again, don't worry about all the text here, um, but just looking at revitalizing traditional burning practices. Um, the, this is what some communities are doing. So, what they're doing is going into communities and talking with their elders about you know, how they burned, why they burned, looking at key concerns or barriers um, about burning. And in British Columbia, where this um, particular project was done, there's been huge out of control wildfires that have really impacted people. And there is a lot of fear of putting fire back on the ground in these unhealthy landscapes. Um, so it's looking at you know, next steps, what can we do to make it so that we can put cultural fire back safely on the ground. And a lot of that is with partnerships with agencies. In Canada as well, we're forming a national Indigenous fire working group. And so the idea here is to have a group so Indigenous people can push um, policies and other priorities related to fire at a national level. So right now it seems kind of at times like it's just different nations that are fighting against uh, different agencies for their right to burn. Um, and so the idea here is to form um, a larger group. And so the idea for this group came out of engagement sessions with 46 Indigenous fire experts across Canada. And we formed a steering committee of 12 people to develop the terms of reference. And we actually meet at the end of the month um, to take that next step. Again, speaking about the Guardian program, so this is similar to um, what we see in Australia with their um, Aboriginal Ranger program. And this is really looking at rekindling our relationship with fire through using uh, First Nation fire guardians. Um, and again, don't worry about all the text here. Um, it's just showing that we had an engagement session talking with communities about how we can create a national strategy for Indigenous fire guardians, what's needed, what communities need, how we can take fire back. Um, and so there's still next steps on this one. And they're right now they're doing three different um, pilot projects to see 
um, you know, if it, if, if it can work in Canada. There's also in Canada, a lot of our wildland firefighters who are Indigenous. Um, we have a group of firefighters in Canada called Type 2, which is also referred to as like a mop-up firefighter, um, or like a, it's really like, it's really the heart of firefighting, actually, like the folks that are on the ground digging, you know, putting out fire. Um, and most of those people are Indigenous in Canada, and um, they're really not recognized for their jobs. It's not like, you know, a a job like a heli tack or other things where there's a lot of glorification around the job. And so um, we did a study on the cultural safety of Indigenous wildland firefighters. So looking at, you know, what are their experiences regarding accidents or injuries, sickness, uh, chronic illness, close calls, or racism, discrimination, or harassment. And then what is currently working on the fire line in terms of promoting cultural safety? And what are the priority needs and issues um, for enhancing cultural safety? So unsurprisingly, um, over half of our survey and uh, focus group respondents had experienced uh, harassment or discrimination in their jobs, which I mean is, is terrible. Um, and if in any other profession, you know, that would be a uh, huge like scandal. Um, but unfortunately for Indigenous firefighters, it almost seems like something that they have to endure. So we're looking at really addressing that and how we can fix it. So we have lots of issues in Canada still related to this. Um, there's low recognition of Indigenous expertise related to fire. There's a lot of power dynamics around fire. So for example, it's not just about fire. Like if um, in Canada, we have what we call crown land and a large portion, I think it's like 85% of Canada is crown land. So it's um, technically owned by the federal government, by, but managed by the provinces and territories. And so the idea is, you know, that if suddenly an Indigenous community is given permission to burn on this crown land, then that recognizes um, that that's their territory. So then that impacts uh, the sovereignty and autonomy of Indigenous people by recognizing their land base. Uh, so there's been lots of reluctance uh, to let Indigenous peoples uh, burn or, or lead burning on this land. Uh, there's massive amounts of money spent on flying experts. Um, so lots of times our wildfire agencies will bring people into these communities instead of, you know, recognizing the existing expertise. There's no sustained funding. So most jobs in fire management in Canada are seasonal for Indigenous people. Um, there's one-off projects. So we do a lot of one-off cultural burns where a community will get together and do one burn. Um, but it actually does little to revitalize the practice and to actually reduce the risk of the community for larger wildfires. And then the communities here face with overwhelming requests um, really compared to the capacity that they have to fulfill those requests. And again, it comes down to kind of a social justice thing where, you know, if um, lots of times, you know, people will just say, well, agencies like uh, wildfire management agencies can just take over the burning, but Really, if we're putting fire back on the landscape and Indigenous people will, were told that they couldn't burn, maybe it should be them that's like given the torch to put that fire back. So again, this is my last slide here. So just to end, we have a fire podcast called the Good Fire Podcast, Stories of Indigenous Fire Stewardship. And so there's two seasons. So the left is the graphic from the first season and the second is the graphic from the second season, um, and it, in it, we interview a different expert on each um, episode of different Indigenous fire keepers, fire carriers, fire knowledge holders um, internationally who are putting fire back in their territories. And so, yeah, it's a really fun series. I learned a lot um, doing it. And so if you're interested, it's available on all podcasting platforms. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing here. Well, that was and fantastic. Amy, and I, you probably can't hear me still. So um, yeah, I can also, I'll, I'll get to Amy in a minute. She's probably like, I can't hear. Uh, I have listened to the Good Fire podcast and I think you guys will find it great. Um, I think I'm gonna try to do questions by chat. So, or you guys can voice it to me. If you guys don't wanna type, I can try to give questions by chat to Amy and she can respond. Let me, let me type her so she knows what's up. Yeah, did you make sure that she tried to just turn up the volume <laughs> um, on her speaker? Okay. 
Okay. Um, I assume she will try that. Does anyone have any questions? I'll try to pass them on, or you guys can type it into the chat session. Well, I mean, I have a question, but I'll let you type because you're younger. Sure. And okay. okay. <laughs> sure. What so, is it, Bruce? Yeah, I'm just kind of, does she have a kind of overall view of when it's most appropriate to allow the indigenous fire practices and when it you need to use prescriptive? Or does she okay, see it yeah. all as, you know, you know, uh, okay. indigenous as the ideal? That's one of the questions I had. So let me see if it's okay. make it succinct. Okay. <laughs> Government computer. <laughs> oh, I just I can hear you. It's a miracle. Ah, oh, there you go. Oh, you can? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Like it was off and oh. now I can hear it just popped back on. I didn't even touch anything. Super yeah. Bruce, then you can you can you can start again because I think I really tried to shorten yeah. what you had asked. You had said it much more elegantly. Well, I don't know about that, but but I was just asking, um, Amy, um yeah. do you have a sort of overall view of in some ideal world, not necessarily the one the Canadian government will give you, but in some ideal world, yeah. what would be the appropriate space for indigenous cultural burnings versus prescriptive burnings? Do you have some sort of ideal division of labor um, between these? And what would, if so, what is it? <laughs> yeah, great question. And I think I actually get this a little bit at Parks Canada because here we have people that are very committed to the prescribed fire program that Parks Canada has. And so I think they get a little nervous when we start talking about cultural fire. But for me, like I see it as a shared responsibility. So my frustration right now is that it's pretty much 100% prescribed fire in Canada um, and very little room for Indigenous people to be involved. And so what we're hoping to see, at least with Parks Canada, is that we continue our current prescribed fire program. but also start allowing and supporting cultural burning um, on parks managed land. And um, so I think that another thing too is that because of the forest mismanagement in Canada, we'll always need prescribed fire. Like um, when I go and talk to elders, the first thing that most say is that like, we can't go and light our cultural fires in this forest. Like we'll burn down our town, you know? <laughs> so what they're really, and I think that they're aware how unhealthy the forest is. And so what, been happening in some of those communities is that they've been partnering with experts in prescribed fire to come in and do those really high risk um, prescribed fires so that then they can go back and do the interval burning safely. You know, so after it's kind of the stand has been replaced or cleaned up or whatever, then, you know, it's safe for grandpa and his son to go out and do some light burning in the spring. But what we're seeing right now is that in many of our forests, we can't do that. It's just much too dangerous. Um, and so like, that's another thing too, is that right now we need like that incident command system and we need on many of our fires to wear the PPE and stuff because yeah, our forests are just, they're um, honestly dangerous for fire right now. Yeah. And so another thing I should say too, that we're seeing is that um, lot, there's a lot of like a mechanical thinning of the forest that's going on. Uh, so like it, we, we call it in Canada fire smart projects, but it's basically money that's gone to, you know, thin and clean up around the community through mechanical means. So either machinery or hand thinning. And what we're seeing right now is really good actually partnerships. So once an area has gone through and thinned, then, you know, having that good fire go back on the landscape has been really positive. And um, I think that science really backs that up. Like Susan Pritchard and her colleagues have found that that you know, the thinning plus the regular burning is really what's needed to reduce risk to communities long term. Mm -hmm. You have a question in the uh, in the chat. Maybe you should read okay. that. Yeah. Uh, from Paul Eagles. OK, so yeah, how can we best access Indigenous knowledge in these regards as non-Indigenous? It's very hard to find info and seems to be very guarded for good reasons due to the Canadian history. and. Yeah, I agree with that. And even like in the nations that I work with, many don't want their information out there. They don't want out the areas they used to burn, the reasons why they burned or anything. And it's, I think due to that whole mistrust of government thing. And so the best stuff that I'm seeing right now is these partnerships being formed. So between the local nation, 
um, and then agencies there that are supporting them. And so what they're doing there is basically supporting the nation and doing like values assessments, archeological assessments, cultural fire assessments that then the nation keeps in their archives. And then they call in like the outside agencies or outside experts to support them in putting fire back. Um, and so in Canada, I don't know if you guys have it, but in Canada, we have OCAP laws, which are ownership, control, access and possession of data. Um, and so that is what a lot of communities uh, refer to when talking about fire um, and, and their knowledge. So yeah, it's hard. I think um, I think the best thing is is to you know to I don't know Paul too maybe where you are or what is um, because there's there's different ways. So there's groups like the First Nations Emergency Services Society that works with Indigenous communities on this. Um, okay, so you're yeah. So I for Kamloops, I would say that they're the best group to reach out to. The other group in Kamloops is like the Salish Firekeeper Society. I know in California, there's the, um, the new indigenous stewardship network that they formed. There's the cultural burning network. So there's different groups that, you know, can share, can, well, I don't know if share, like I have a hard time with sharing personally, but you know, that you can partner with to kind of move forward on these things. That's great. I guess I have a follow up to some of that. You, you've spoken about a need for collaboration and partnerships yet a lot of mistrust. Do, do you have hope that those barriers are being broken down so that both agencies are having an open mind and saying, yeah, we really need to be thinking about cultural burning versus prescribed burning. And, you know, it seems like sort of a vicious cycle one way and it could be a positive cycle the other way. If trust is slowly <laughs> built, this could become a really good collaborative effort to really bring things back to where they need to be. Do, do, you, do you have hope for that? Or is it looking like it's a steep road or, taking too long to happen. Yeah, so I think there's like, to be polite about it, there's a lot of learning still to be done on the agency side. And I think that that's what we're working on in Canada um, with the fire agencies. I think that like lower down, like the on the ground practitioners, there's a lot of understanding of the, you know, important role of indigenous people in fire and that like local people who live in communities really want to, you know, partner and do that. and part loss of the issues that we're seeing are much higher up, like, you know, the whole power struggle <laughs> issue. So it's like a lot of management um, things. And so one thing that I'm constantly seeing is talk about like integrating indigenous knowledge. And so one example for that is lots of times our fire keepers will get asked to come in and teach an agency about cultural fire. Yet that fire keeper. Oh dear. Uh oh, we lost you for a moment there, Amy. Please come back on. Ah, <laughs> oh, technology. She's still connected. Oh, yeah. She, she, yeah, I think you're still connected. Amy, can you hear us okay? We've lost you for about 30 seconds here so far. Mm. You for She could try turning off her screen, I guess. Yeah. We will see. Sorry for all, this is the, the world we live in. Great technology to bring in someone from Canada and last week, but <laughs> the internet. Yeah. We'll give her a couple of moments, but I guess if not, we might have to call that the day. Yeah. Sometimes turning off all the cameras helps because then. Yeah, let's do that. Let's all turn off the camera. All right. Oh. Yeah, let's turn off our cameras and see if we can get Amy back. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. oh, she's connecting to audio. That's a promising Sorry. sign. All right, Amy. <laughs> We're going to give you bandwidth by staying off of our visuals. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me okay, though? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't, yeah. You, you got cut off by a couple minutes ago. Um, okay. Where you were no, really, I, yeah, I think... you had all our attention. So we're like, oh, we want to hear more. <laughs> oh, sorry. Please, I think ahead. I was just trying to 
say, I saw you guys freeze and I'm like, oh no, what's happened? So because I'm in the yeah. north, unfortunately, we don't have the greatest internet, which is also an issue. Um, but yeah, I think I was just saying how like it's hypocritical in Canada because the agencies want firekeepers to come in and teach their staff, but then they don't allow those firekeepers to actually go out and practice on their own. Hmm. Yeah, that's weird. That is very hypocritical and really pretty harsh. I think Jordan has a question for you in the chat, Amy. I don't know whether you can see it. Yeah. 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 Jordan said, curious what Blazing the Trail says the difference are between good fires and bad fires. Okay. Yeah. So in Blazing the Trail, what we try to talk about, and I mean, like, it's hard to have that dichotomy. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah. Amy, we lost you again. Yeah, sorry. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. So yeah, in Canada, um, you know, or sorry, we try not to have this like dichotomy, like the whole like bad and good fires, black and white. But I find from an educational standpoint for people, it's the easiest to kind of explain what Indigenous burning is. Um, and so when we look at like the bad fire, we're looking at those fires that people are scared of, you know, that the big fires that cause evacuations. And although sometimes they can have or good impacts on the landscape, in Canada, what we're seeing now, though, is that many of those fires that, you know, historically might have had good ecological impacts by going across the land, that they're actually causing destruction. So lots of them are burning through our soil and turning areas into deserts. And so it's quite worrying now, like how hot and how intense the fires are burning. Yeah. Um, and so that would be that whole idea of like the bad fire. Um, and again, I understand that bad fires can have good impacts too sometimes. Um, but yeah, again, we're trying to just address it for so people can really understand that that the good fire is the idea of like having a relationship and a respect for fire and using fire um, in low risk ways that produce good impacts on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Amy, I know that some wildfire purists hate that. We call it good fire and bad fire, but. Yeah. Well, I, I think Bruce has a comment, but I would like to say that I liked your term fire of choice. I think you showed in one of your slides. That was mm -hmm. sort of more neutral and pretty insightful. But go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I was struck with the number of evacuations people have in some of these provinces, particularly mm -hmm. it's like a band in the middle of the country there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so let me ask you a very controversial question, and I think I know what you're going to say, but uh, okay, perfect. is there any discussion of areas <clears throat> tried to restrict growth in these wildland um, interface areas, in other words, or retreating? I mean, when you've got seven times, you have to evacuate. Um, yeah. There are some areas, do you think ultimately that uh, are just too dangerous to live in uh, given climate change or is it just too hard to even bring that topic up? Yeah, good question. And I think like for some communities in Canada, especially indigenous communities, it's difficult because for many, the area where they currently are, where their reserve is, is not actually their traditional area. It's where they were forced by colonization. Mm -hmm. um, so like my family is a good example of that one side is that, you know, we're from the prairies in Manitoba and we ended up north in the boreal forest, um, you know, where it's much higher risk of these big fires, high impactful fires. Um, so I, there isn't a movement in Canada right now, especially for Indigenous communities. Like we have communities that get flooded out every year in some communities that still haven't returned home. And there is discussion around moving their reserve. But again, it's not like nothing's happening or nothing's moving on that part. And that's a lot of that is because of, you know, the ownership of land and where would they go and all those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, in Canada, that's just, um, yeah, there's not really a movement there. I think the other issue is, is that, you know, for many like the other side of my family, the Piesis band side, like we're from the north, we're from the boreal forest and have lived there for, you know, th thousands of years, that line of the family. And so then lived there well, like in, in well off the land. And so I think that then too, there's a, you know, frustration basically in having to abandon um, that territory because of like colonial mismanagement. 
Uh, so yeah, I don't see any of my relatives anytime soon <laughs> um, leaving, but um, I think it's a good question and it's something that, you know, I think, so one of the big focuses now in Canada, especially for those communities is adaptation to climate change. Mm -hmm. So especially in our North where we're already seeing the impacts of climate change, it's just accepting that, you know, climate change is happening and that communities are going to have to adapt and looking at things that we can do um, to encourage that adaptation. And so cultural burning has been one thing that's kind of come up quite a bit around reducing fuel load around communities. What about the smoke issue? I mean, is there, uh, is there any thought about uh, ways that you could create community centers with, uh, you know, good smoke air purifiers or whatever, so that you don't have to evacuate so many people because of smoke per se? Yeah, another really good question. And it's been very frustrating in Canada watching these evacuations occur over and over. Where, like you said, a community building that has really good like um, smoke scrubber or uh, air scrubbers or whatever would actually probably mitigate that. And especially like when they're evacuating these communities, they're calling in military aircraft and military helicopters and things to assist in the evacuation. So it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is one, there is a, one group in uh, northern uh, Saskatchewan right now that's working on what they call them as like smoke havens up here um, so that, you know, they can have some type of central evacuate or like area that people can then go. But one of the big issues that we see though is like um, in 2017, 2018 and 2021, we were just covered in, in Canada with smoke. Like it was, um, even though the fires like weren't near me in Alberta, we sat under smoke for like six weeks. Uh, and so it affected lots of vulnerable people. And when it's that widespread across Canada, like there's almost, you know, not you know, nowhere that's central, you know, that you could put something like that. And then also, we also suck on a lot of smoke from like California, Oregon and Washington state. Yeah. So yeah, unfortunately, smoke, I think will continue to be a huge impact. But I also see smoke as like the hope for pushing political change. Because many times these communities that are impacted are, you know, 100 people that live in the boreal forest and politicians don't have that much sympathy. But when you're having like large urban centers smoked out for six weeks, it becomes a much bigger political issue. Yeah, I know. I actually have a book that's coming out in the fall, which makes exactly that argument. <laughs> oh, neat. No. You'll have to send me the link. <laughs> I will, yeah. Perfect. Uh, by the way, one That's of our great. one of the people on our call right now is Mary uh, and Pruniki, who has done a lot of work on wildfire smoke and including the impacts oh. on firefighters. I don't know whether Mary's still there or not, but um, that that is a topic of great interest uh, here in um, at Stanford. I don't know, Mary, you want to say yeah. a little bit about the, what, what you guys have discovered? Um, sure. I mean, we're you know, we published a retrospective um, study looking at the impact of prescribed burn um, versus wildfires on children. Um, and, you know, currently we've been working with the firefighters, um, looking at long term and also acute smoke impacts on health. Um, and what we're working towards now was looking and a more detailed um, controlled study of comparing the wildfires and the prescribed burns and also incorporating like smoke component analysis. Um, so we have a much better idea of, uh, you know, uh, how the smoke toxicity is compared. Um, mm -hmm. And then also looking at, you know, typically there's more vulnerable populations where these prescribed burns are going on. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, an area that really needs some, some attention, yeah. especially so, in terms yeah. of mitigation. Awesome. Yeah, I, sh I should have said, Amy, that Mary's uh, unit is called the Sean Parker Center. And uh, oh. what, what they do is actual blood tests uh, <laughs> to determine the effects mm -hmm. of this, these things. So uh, I don't know whether there's, uh, you know, it may be something that you want to uh, check out their website and talk to Mary and uh, about at some point in the future, because... Uh, there are a lot of what I, I, I and Mary, I'm probably getting into your area here, but I, I have a friend. Who, I, I have a friend who has a son who's a firefighter, a wildfire fighter, and so he pays attention to this very closely. And there's a lot of machismo, <laughs> in yeah. American. And I'm going to guess there's up in Canada too, where 
people uh, f who are fighting these fires are not using the protective devices they're given. So there's a lot of need down here to get yeah. this information out to firefighters. I don't know, do you agree with that, Mary, or not? Um, yeah, in fact, um, I was just re-recording, we're making a um, like a, a, tr a small training video for wild and firefighters um, to just educate them on the health impacts of smoke. And also, you know, to give some general tips um, when they are, when they're doing their maneuvers, maybe some ways that you can reduce exposure. So I think it's an area that really needs um, uh, some education, um, you know, so at least they're aware when they're making the choices they are, you know, uh, how their health may be impacted. There was a study that came out recently that showed that um, firefighters who do not wash their hands before eating or drinking are at increased risk for certain types of cancers. Oh. oh, wow. Yeah, so it's really wow. um, an area that I think, you know, education would be super helpful. Yeah. So, yeah, Amy, I mean, oh, you should. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna say, I'd be really interested in that video to especially to share it with our agency here. All right. Okay. Um, uh, I'll put my um, email in the chat. How about, and we can connect. Perfect. Or I can, yeah, either way in the chat or I can uh, connect to both of you. So, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> No, in fact, I'll do I'll do that right now. After this, I will send an email to both of you. Oh, okay. So you guys have that. That's quite easy, Amy and Mary. Thank you. Well, I think that calls it for time. But uh, Amy, thanks for sticking with us with the AV issues. And uh, thank you for everyone who stuck around for the conversation. And Amy, it's just been a, a pleasure having you here today. You, you provide so many new insights that I think we need to think about. So I'm glad you were able to participate and take your valuable time and share your insights with us today. Um, yeah, and I, there's only a few of you left. Oh, I was just saying, I'm yeah. so glad I could hear you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's only a few left, but we have one more next week. So if you want to hear Bill Messner, he's coming back next week, and hopefully we will get over our technical hurdles for the rest of the quarter. Thanks again, Amy, and we'll see all of you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.